The 1950s were tumultuous times in the world of filmmaking. The Second World War had ended and everyone was ready to spend money. Consumerism was on the rise, but with it came the most important means of advertising, the television. The television was more than just an advertising machine, though. It was a threat to cinema itself. When compared to the 1940s, there's no better metric to see changing audience expectations than the films that made the most money. In the 40s, American audiences loved films like This is the Army, Sergeant York, The Best Years of Our Lives, and For Whom the Bell Tolls. All dealt with themes of war and honor, and all featured older actors in leading roles. Now, let's compare that to the 50s, where top box office hits were The Ten Commandments, Ben-Hur, and Around the World in 80 Days. All were over three hours, with The Ten Commandments and Ben-Hur nearly at four. All featured large casts and even larger stories, and most importantly, all featured aspect ratios much wider than the 4x3 native to television. Put simply, the pictures got bigger. These intimate stories of love and loss from the 40s were perfectly comfortable on television, and if cinemas didn't innovate, they'd fall victim to the same mantra we hear today. I'll skip it in the theaters and wait for it on TV. There was no denying it. As much as studios resisted the inevitable, audiences became perfectly satisfied with their televisions at home, and theater attendance dropped dramatically. But movie studios would not go quietly, and innovation after innovation were introduced in order to hold on to the audiences. 20th Century Fox had Cinemascope. Paramount had VistaVision. Cinerama was a process involving three screens placed side by side. If you wanted an experience like that, you're not getting it on television. Still, while these were effective methods, they cost money. It wasn't as if anyone could afford to make a feature in Cinerama, and with the 50s and the explosion of the B-movie, independent filmmakers had to innovate and find ways for their films to succeed in such a crowded market. Enter the gimmick. Enter William Castle. Enter the 1958 film Macabre. Macabre follows a doctor, as he learns his daughter has been buried alive and he has but mere hours to rescue her. In addition to his life policy, Castle had actors pose as nurses in the theater lobbies, with hearses parked outside to take away dead theatergoers. Like many films of the time, Macabre was better in trailer and poster than it was in actuality. But, posters and trailers were what got butts and seats and dollars in hand, so that was enough for Castle at first. And with that, the king of the gimmick was born. Castle was actually born in 1914 as William Schloss. When he was 13, his life changed upon watching Bela Lugosi portray Dracula in the stage play of the same name. Castle watched that show again and again, building a reputation for himself as one of the show's biggest fans. He leveraged that title with Lugosi himself after meeting him following one night's show. Lugosi got him a job on Dracula as an assistant stagehand, a job that Castle dropped out of high school to take. And in typical Castle fashion, his big break came through sensationalization and tall tales. Castle was given an opportunity to direct the German actress Ellen Schwanecke in a play he wrote. However, when Hitler invited Schwanecke home for a German festival, Castle persuaded her to say no, billing her as the girl who said no to Hitler. To add further fuel to the fabricated fire, Castle broke the windows of his theater and painted swastikas over every wall. Everyone had to see it. And so 19 years later, when Macabre premiered, it did so to enormous success. But Castle was just getting started. Following Macabre was House on Haunted Hill, a film about a haunted house and several people who volunteer to stay in it for one night, with the hopes of receiving $10,000 if they survive. House on Haunted Hill was billed as the first film filmed in Emerjo, the plastic skeleton, which flew around the theater at pivotal parts of the film. This gimmick didn't last long, though, as once word spread, it became a popular game with many kids throwing popcorn and soda at the skeleton, knocking it down in the process. One Time article in 1959 estimates that the picture cost $150,000, but Castle spent $250,000 manufacturing skeletons that dance off the screen and dangle out over the audiences. The gimmick has paid off so well that Castle expects to take in well over $3 million. Following that was The Tingler, a picture that features a monster that can only be defeated by screaming. 
One pivotal moment of the film asked the audience to scream for their lives, and in order to help persuade them, Castle hired actors to scream in fright, others to faint from fear, and he hired fake nurses to carry them out on stretchers. At a certain point, watching the film itself became second to the chaos that happened inside the theater. Near the end of the film, the tingler makes its way loose inside of the theater, and Castle wired certain seats to shock members of the audience to enhance the suspense. One particularly enthused filmgoer named John Waters claimed he would see the film repeatedly, searching for the seats that were rigged with wires for maximum thrill. Howard Thompson of the New York Times called it one of the worst, dullest little horror entries ever to snake into movie houses. But audiences disagreed, and it made Castle a household name. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not panic, but scream, scream for your lives. The tingler is loose in this theater, and if you don't scream, it may kill you. Scream, scream, keep screaming, scream for your lives. It's here, it's over here. Ladies and gentlemen, the the tingler has been paralyzed by your screaming. There is no more danger. We will now resume the showing of the movie. 1960 saw the release of 13 Ghosts and the introduction of Illusiono. Audiences received red and blue glasses, and if they were too scared during pivotal scenes involving ghosts, they could use the blue section of the glasses, called the Ghost Remover, to avoid seeing the action unfold. Castle was always a showman, often introducing the audience to his films and reveling in all the cheesiness that his campiness brought. Homicidal was a take on Psycho in 1961, featuring a manic woman in an early depiction of cross-dressing. It was also perhaps Castle's most ambitious gimmick, as he offered full refunds to those too cowardly to finish the picture. John Waters described Castle as simply nuts. He came up with Coward's Corner, a yellow cardboard booth manned by a bewildered theater employee in the lobby. When the fright break was announced and you found that you couldn't take it anymore, you had to leave your seat and in front of the entire audience follow yellow footsteps up the aisle, bathed in a yellow light. Before you reached Coward's Corner, you crossed yellow lines with the stenciled message, Cowards Keep Walking. You passed a nurse who would offer a blood pressure test. All the while, a recording was blaring, watch the chicken, watch him shiver in Coward's Corner, As the audience howled, you had to go through one final indignity. At Coward's Corner, you were forced to sign a yellow card stating, I am a bona fide coward. Castle continued these gimmicks for years, but after Homicidal, he found himself struggling to continue to innovate. Negative reception also hurt Castle, who felt that he was making good films in addition to good gimmicks. What followed were attempts to make better films. Ten seconds more and we go into the house. It's now or never. Five. Four, you're a brave audience. Two, one. One such attempt was 1961's Mr. Sardonicus, a thriller where, at the climax of the film, the audience becomes the jury, with each member being able to vote on the fate of the antagonist. In theaters, glow-in-the-dark cards were held up for Mr. Castle to count. At drive-ins, headlights flashed. Still, the reviews were negative, with one reviewer calling it elaborately produced and evoking disgust. By Castle's death in 1977, his films were making less money and less waves. His 1964 film, Straight Jacket, was gimmickless, based on recommendations by financial backers. But Castle couldn't resist, and right as the film was about to release in a straightforward manner, Castle printed out cardboard axes and handed them to patrons. So Castle was unable to find success. His final hope was in directing and producing the film Rosemary's Baby, which he mortgaged his home to buy the rights for. It would seem luck was not on his side, though, as Paramount gave the directing duties to a newcomer, Roman Polanski. Castle settled for a cameo. Still, while Castle's end may have been an unfortunate one, his ideas live on. Four years after he passed away of a heart attack, one director implemented a new gimmick in his 1981 film, Polyester. 
This was Odorama, a scratch and sniff card that audiences would scratch as numbers popped on screen informing them to do so. That director? His name was John Waters, and he was the same boy who would see the tingler repeatedly, searching for that maximum thrill. So while Castle's films may have faded in the larger cultural zeitgeist, his influence lives on. And honestly, that's nothing to be afraid of. My name is Colby Sanders, and I'm the writer and editor of When the Pictures Got Bigger. Thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed the episode, please like, comment, and subscribe for future installments. Until the next time, I'll see you at the movies. Subtract 40. No mercy. So be it. You have given the verdict. You have made the decision, and the majority of you have sentenced Mr. Sardonicus to further punishment. Mr. Projectionist, let the sentence be carried out. <laughs>